So good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Thanks, you can all be here today. I'm very excited um, about Dr. Asarno's um, uh, talk today. Um, she's a research, uh, her research program aims to reduce the burden of mental illness in youth by developing behavioral interventions that are effective, youth-friendly, engaging, widely disseminable, and easily accessible. Yes, 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 please. Um, her program of research has primarily focused on sleep as a potential target for intervention in the prevention and treatment of mental and physical health problems. She received her PhD at UC Berkeley, what, what, um, where she trained with Dr. Allison Harvey, completed her internship at UNC Chapel Hill, and her postdoctoral fellowship at Stanford with Dr. Rachel Manber. She joined the UCSF faculty in November 2019. Since joining the UCSF faculty, um, she has established the Child and Adolescent Behavioral Sleep Medicine Clinic, where she treats youth of all ages for sleep health disturbances. Her research is currently funded by an NIMH Career Development Award, the Klingenstein Third Generation Foundation, NARSAT, and the UCSF STSI. Um, please join me in a warm welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Excited for your talk. I'm going to be quiet now and give you the floor. Thank you, Dr. Stewart, for that warm welcome. I really appreciate it. Um, well, thank you so much for having me. I am just so thrilled to be here. Um, so first, before I start, I just wanted to let you know that I have no disclosures. Uh, and my talk is going to take us through a series of four questions that my work seeks to address using a multi-methods approach. First is, why does sleep matter? Second, can we modify sleep? And third, can we get that sleep treatment to the kids who really need it? I'll discuss my relevant longitudinal and treatment data that is sought to answer these questions. So anyone who has been in a classroom, which most of you have, right, has seen a picture like this. And it got me thinking about it. Evidence indicates that 45 to 70% of adolescents struggle with one or more sleep problems. And one could imagine that these two girls can have a very different experience during the day. There are a number of different ways to measure or describe those sleep difficulties that this young woman might find herself experiencing. The most commonly researched ones are short sleep duration, daytime sleepiness, poor sleep quality, and insomnia. These have been all well researched and are associated both cross-sectionally and longitudinally with adverse outcomes among youth. But there's one contributor to burden that's particularly important when considering adolescent development. And this is circadian preference or circadian rhythm. A circadian rhythm is roughly a 24 hour cycle in this physiological process of living. So this is an example of a circadian cycle. Down along the x-axis is the time of day. And this individual we might consider sort of an intermediate or average circadian preference. They get up at around 7 a.m. and go to bed at around 11 p.m. Now, this person is more of an early morning person. They're typically waking up closer to 5 a.m. and going to bed at 9 p.m. Now, Mary Carskaden's lab at Brown has found and shown that with the onset and progression of puberty, many youth will start to prefer a delay in bedtime. And her group has shown that this has a biological basis and is characteristic of typical development. Indeed, estimates are that between 30 and 40% of teens select later bedtimes. So this is a pattern of behavior that's sometimes referred to eveningness, circadian preference, or just eveningness. Importantly, eveningness tendency um, or late bedtime preference has been shown cross-sectionally to be associated with worse academic outcomes and more depressive symptoms. So given this cross-sectional data, we were interested in what happens long-term to those youth who tend to select late bedtimes um, as they enter adulthood. However, there was no data on longitudinal outcomes for these youth at the time. So we sought to investigate uh, whether late bedtime was a predictor and possible target for intervention to prevent these outcomes. We utilized a data set um, the National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent Health. It contains data on the health and behavior of adolescents in the United States from the ages of 13 to 32 years of age across four waves of data collection. 
And it's a community sample, so it's a wonderful opportunity to examine the value of sleep in the general population. And the present analyses use the public use data set. We had about a little over 3,000 kids, and the sample is considered to be nationally representative. And our first aim was to determine the longitudinal relationship between short total sleep time and late bedtime between the ages of 13 to 18 and cumulative GPA at high school graduation by wave three, as well as depression symptoms. We tested our hypotheses that late school year bedtime and short sleep duration would be associated with worse academic performance and depressive symptoms using linear and logistic regression analyses. Um, sleep and circadian variables were all determined via self-report measures because this is a huge data set. Um, they didn't unfortunately have any objective measures. So school year bedtime was defined by response to this question. The top tertile of school year bedtimes was defined as the late school year bedtime group. Then the middle tertile was defined as the intermediate group or the comparison group. Total sleep time was defined by response to this question. And based on research um, by Mary Carskaden again, showing that nine hours of sleep is the recommended quantity of sleep for adolescents. Short total sleep time was defined as adolescents who reported sleeping fewer than nine hours habitually, and adequate total sleep time was defined as adolescents who reported sleeping nine or more hours habitually. As we recognize this, that this is very much an ideal quantity of sleep, um, we also ran all of our analyses with seven or fewer hours as the cutoff for short total sleep time, and the results were essentially the same. So now for our outcome variables, ad health also was connected to um, actual high school, a database of actual high school transcripts. So data provided official grades um, of cumulative grade point average for all years of high school completed by wave three. And um, depression symptoms were a composite score of, um, of these questions based on previous research. And recall this was our aim. And this we had hypothesized that both late school year bedtime and short total sleep time would be associated with worse academic outcomes. And here are our results. So late school year bedtime at wave one did indeed predict worse academic outcomes at high school graduation. Interestingly, short total sleep time did not. And we had the same results when it came to depression symptoms. So taking these results together, a pattern emerges in sorting out how to measure sleep and predict these outcomes and what a potential target would be. So late school year bedtime appears to be the most consistent predictor of academic and emotional risk um, for these particular studies. And indeed, Wolfson and Karskaden posited that um, adolescents who have difficulty shifting their weeknight bedtime to accommodate an early morning school start schedule represent a particularly high risk group. These results highlight the importance of measuring bedtime as a contributor to burden, not just total sleep time. And these results imply that further research should focus on school year bedtime as a prime target for preventative interventions in the emotional and academic domains. And indeed, that is just what my graduate student lab, led by Dr. Allison Harvey at UC Berkeley, did. So Dr. Harvey's lab was funded by NICHD to help late bedtime youth between 11 to 18 years of age get to bed earlier. Um, Dr. Harvey developed TRANS-C, which is a modular intervention that incorporates components of existing evidence-based sleep interventions, namely cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, chronotherapy, and interpersonal person, and social rhythms therapy. And it's very much founded in basic sleep and circadian science and targets sleep health as a um, trans di di diagnostic target. <clears throat> so we recruited 176 youth from the Bay Area who were then randomized to either trans-C or a psychoeducation control. And you can see results indicate from the HER trial that there is a significant treatment effect on sleepiness that, um, and also sleep quality, which is abbreviated here with this PSQI, which is a measure called the PISCI. And youth in the trans-C group also reported identifying as having less eveningness circadian preference following treatment. That's abbreviated here with the CMEP. 
And using the gold standard measurement of circadian timing, dim light melatonin onset, here abbreviated as DILBO, it appears that an actual biological advancement in circadian timing occurred in the trans C group as compared to the control group. So um, taken together, these results indicate that sleep is indeed modifiable and that's great news. And we can actually shift biology, which leads me to my next question. Can we now get this effective sleep treatment to the kids who really need it? However, here we have a problem. There are only 552,000 mental health providers in the US. Only a little over 2,200 child or pediatric psychologists. And even more problematic, there are only 412 registered sleep treatment providers in the United States. That's likely an underestimate, but it's still a low number. <laughs> and we estimate that there's over 12 million teens in the US with sleep difficulties. That is a real work face, workforce challenge. So how do we get these kids this treatment? Enter this photo. So cell phone use is almost ubiquitous among youth. So the thought is, can we leverage cell phone use among youth to make this treatment available? So two companies have developed online sleep treatments for adults, which are available commercially. Um, the biggest ones are Sleepio and Shut Eye, which is now um, branded as Somrist. Results from these studies have been published in journals like The Lancet and New England Journal of Medicine, showing that these programs improve sleep among adults. However, no online or mobile interventions were, are available to youth. So we set out to develop our own. And because youth report that they have, whoops, sorry. <laughs> um, because youth report that they have almost ubiquitous access, access to smartphone over a computer, we decided to deliver the intervention over a smartphone. So the intervention was developed using theoretical models and lessons from other digital health intervention development experts. For example, we use a team science approach. My team is comprised of interdisciplinary researchers. In the top row are, my two, are two of my mentors. I'm fortunate to have two of the world's leading experts on sleep interventions on my team. On the right is Dr. Allison Harvey and on the left is Dr. Rachel Manber. And in the second row here are my mobile internet health experts. Um, then other stakeholders include teachers, educators, adolescent mental and general health care providers, industry advertising experts from companies like Twitter, Apple, and Facebook, and perhaps the most important collaborators of all were youth and their parents. So Bright Mobile was developed using a dynamic process involving extensive collaboration with all of these stakeholders. The treatment was then refined, integrating what was learned from stakeholders in the pre-testing phase and was refined again following the completion of the pilot testing. And we believe that because of this dynamic process, the resulting product, Bright Mobile, has a by teens for teens kind of feeling. So the first step was to figure out, um, sorry. So Bright Mobile is a user-friendly and developmentally appropriate modularized eight-week digital intervention delivered on mobile phones. And rather than develop an application which is expensive and subject to the challenge of evolving technologies, we developed a digital health intervention approach that combines and utilizes an already existing and widely commercially used platforms, um, Vimeo, REDCap and Healthy SMS developed by our very own Adrian Aguilera. Um, and none of these require any application or platform integration on the part of the user. It's compatible with all smartphones and all operating systems. So this strategy is also um, utilized to maximize, maximize future scalability. <clears throat> to capitalize on the way youth are inclined to use their mobile phones, we kind of broke that um, 45 minute once a week model. Um, of a therapy session, and we shortened the clinical content substantially, distilled it to animated video modules that can be accessed on demand and completed it in between two and seven minutes. Based on research regarding how to engage the attention of youth, no individual scene is longer than 30 seconds. <laughs> the video content is very easy to access. It'll be del it's delivered by a series of text messages, 
these test, text messages are automatically sent several times a week at a predetermined time. And this is meant to sort of mimic the idea of a therapy appointment. And lastly, opening the videos only requires one click on a link from a text message, which was very important for our participants. The videos follow the sleep problems of three different characters with typical sleep problems, but unusual names and hobbies. The storytelling model was selected based on feedback from youth about how they like to learn. Videos were cre created using techniques from memory consolidation research to improve the likelihood that the information will be retained. And each video ends with a series of two to three take home points that summarize the main behavior change focus for the week. The treatments modularized to enhance this kind of precision medicine approach. It's designed to treat the two most prevalent sleep health concerns among youth, late bedtimes, as we discussed earlier, and insomnia, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, but that's a difficulty initiating or maintaining sleep. In blue are the six core modules, which will be delivered to all participants in a prescribed order. And in the original uh, in-person trans D treatment, the therapist used an individualized case conceptualization approach to select additional modules. But in this study, the patient's responses to baseline assessments dictate which sleep health deficit specific modules are assigned based on an algorithm, and here are shown in dark blue. Not pictured here, we also provide a parent module. So the parent module orients parents to the treatment and encourages them to positively reinforce youth effort, letting the youth take responsibility and assisting only when invited. And as you can see here, we also provide a complementary module to the youth to support the effective communication of their sleep goals and needs to their parents. Bright Mobile has three other components. So sleep diaries are completed daily via text message and weekly ratings of depression and sleep quality are also gathered. Then following every video, there is a digital worksheet that is meant to personalize recommendations that are discussed in the learning modules and help teens create their sleep goals for the week. And then there's text support messages. So digital health interventions are more effective when some support is provided. Bright Mobile uses a bank of text message that we've developed um, through the course of developing this intervention that support patient engagement and learning. So we positively reinforce them completing their learning modules, reinforce um, patients' goal attainment for the week, and um, reinforce uh, and, and, and um, remind the patient of weekly recommendations provided by the program. Patients can text back with questions or comments to the researchers. <clears throat> so step number two is trying to figure out so we have the program now, where can kids get the best access to this care? So the integration of behavioral health within primary care services is increasing and has led to documented improvements in patient outcomes. Most youth in the US have access to primary care services and make one or more visit annually. However, while primary care physicians do acknowledge that sleep is under their purview, they are un sleep health problems remain under evaluated and under treated by primary care physicians. Major barriers to youth perceive, receiving sleep or behavioral health referrals from primary care providers generally include low availability of qualified providers, long wait time when providers are identified. In addition, adolescents and parents often perceive behavioral health treatment as stigmatizing, geographically inconvenient, and often necessitating missed school. So digital health interventions can be easily integrated into primary care and address these significant barriers to treatment, referral, and access. And we were very fortunate to be funded by the Klingon Steed Third Generation Foundation to evaluate the feasibility, effectiveness, and dissemination potential of this innovative strategy for improving access to effective sleep health care for teens. So we're testing Bright Mobile in primary care, or we've completed the study now. <laughs> it was a single arm open pilot among 52 youth. And we decided to focus on low income communities where there is a higher prevalence of sleep problems and lower access to uh, services. Indeed, this par project partially stemmed from the fact that when I was at Stanford, I was trying to develop an integrated behavioral sleep health service within primary care and learned that I could not bill for my services there because our psychiatry department did not have a contract with Medi-Cal. And we have the same issue here at UCSF and many um, institutions have the same issue. So this is really challenging and got me thinking creatively about how we could get these services to these kids. 
Um, the Medi-Cal clinic I selected served primarily first generation Hispanic Latino families. And one of the advantages of a video treatment is that we can easily translate didactic video content into other languages. So because the clinic we were provided, um, providing services to primarily serves a first generation Hispanic and Latino community, we provided the parent module in Spanish. And first, I want to mention that the results that follow are all preliminary, um, and the results have not yet been published. Uh, data, uh, data analysis is still ongoing. So for that reason, I'd like to ask you to please refrain from taking any screenshots of the slides. And our sample is 53 youth. We had one participant we just couldn't turn down. <laughs> and on average, they were 15 years old, 69% were female, 38% identified as Hispanic or Latino, and the racial breakdown roughly reflects the Bay Area. The study outcomes are a mix of quantitative and qualitative data assessing various components of these outcomes. So this diagram is based on the RE-AIM framework, which is frequently used by the implementation and dissemination research science community. Outcome measurements incorporate feedback from youth, their parents, and primary care providers. So we'll be assessing effectiveness, implementation, reach, adoption, and maintenance. The first aim was to assess the effectiveness of Bright Mobile. We hypothesized that Bright Mobile use will result in improvements in sleep quality. The caveat, of course, being that we have no control group for this study. So we will be looking at individual trajectories from baseline weekly throughout treatment, post-treatment, and one month follow-up. So linear mixed effects models show a significant linear trend, suggesting an improvement in sleep quality from pre-treatment through the follow-up period. And here you can see the differences from pre to post treatment in sleep quality. Along the y axis is sleep quality with higher scores indicating worse sleep quality. On the left is the group average at pre treatment, and on the right is the group average at post treatment. Uh, paired t test analyses indicate a significant difference between pre and post treatment sleep quality. And also note that the effect size is very large, which is promising for pilot data. The dotted green line indicates the clinical cutoff for sleep problems. And you can see that the post-treatment group average is almost at the clinical cutoff, cutoff, which is encouraging, and points to a clinically significant improvement in sleep quality. And because we don't have a control group, here I'm providing data on uh, the sleep quality outcomes from Dr. Harvey's in-person trial, which I presented briefly earlier. So this trial was conducted with a similar group of teens over a similar period of time. And here you can see there is nowhere near the change in sleep quality in the control condition that you see in our sample, indicating that it's not probably just a factor of time. The second aim was to assess the effectiveness of Bright Mobile on mental health outcomes. And we hypothesized that Bright Mobile use will result in improvements in depression symptoms. And again, linear mixed effects models show a significant linear trend suggesting a reduction in depressive symptoms from treatment through from pretreatment through the follow-up period. And here you can see differences from pre to post treatment and depression symptoms. So this time along the y-axis, we have the PHQ-9 um, scores with higher scores indicating worse, uh, more severe depression symptoms. On the left is the average at pretreatment, and on the right is the group average at post-treatment. So paired t-test analyses indicate a significant difference between pre and post-treatment in depression severity, and also note the effect size here is, is relatively large. The dotted blue line indicates the clinical cutoff for absence of depression on the PHQ-9, and you can see that the post-treatment group average is close to the clinical cutoff, pointing to a clinically significant improvement in depression symptoms. And we wanted to investigate whether there was a difference between depression outcomes in, the, in a depressed subgroup versus a non-depressed um, subgroup. So here, depressed subgroup is in green, and the non-depressed subgroup is in blue. So we use 10 as the depression cutoff on the PHQ-9 for the depressed sample. And again, you can see there is a significant difference from pre to post treatment in both the depressed and non-depressed subgroups. The clinical cutoff is again shown in blue, indicating a clinically significant depression symptom reduction from pre to post treatment in the depression subgroup. 
So standardized exit interviews were conducted with all participants and their parents, and we have ongoing qualitative data analyses. However, today I'll present just a few quotes from participants to describe their experiences in the intervention. So um, the interviewer asked, did you notice any improvements in your emotional, academic, or general well-being while using the program? Oh yes, on a good day for me was getting at least four hours of sleep. I had a really bad sleeping schedule because I was doing a lot of chores around the house, trying to catch up with schoolwork, getting a lot of schoolwork, and just things outside of school also just building up. I learned how to manage my time more just in order to put the thought in my head that you need to get more sleep. I got a lot more things done. I learned how to manage my time more so that I can sleep. Now I'm sleeping about eight or nine hours. So in response to the same question, another participant says, yes, a lot actually. At the beginning, like I mentioned, I wasn't getting a lot of sleep. I guess about midway through, I noticed a big change because even my mood has changed instead of just being sad and tired all the time. Even my family has noticed I'm more of a cheerful person, more energetic. I started going to the gym, so I'm doing more with my time. So to wrap up our discussion on efficacy, there are signals towards um, efficacy with large effect sizes from pre to post treatment on both sleep quality and depression symptoms. And there's signals towards efficacy with large effect sizes from pre to post treatment on depression symptoms and a depressed subgroup as well, which is nice to see. And obviously we need to conduct a randomized control trial here. So now we're gonna move along the wheel to our third aim, which was to um, talk about implementation. And our third aim is broadly to assess impact on access to care. And this section we're gonna focus um, on whether our intervention was engaging and acceptable. So engagement was measured by the percentage of videos watched. In our study, approximately 70% of the content was viewed. So to give you an idea of how that kind of measures up, compared to other studies uh, that have been published using mobile phone-based digital health interventions among adolescents, um, you, our use data is pretty strong. So for example, in MIMO, a mobile depression prevention program um, only 29% most uh, watched, watched most or all of the content. Another study tested IS steps among adolescent cancer survivor for cancer survivors, excuse me. Um, an average of participants used an average of 63% of the content. And then the average rating for the video content was 4.2 out of five, so decent. Now for some qualitative data on engagement. So the interviewer asked the question, <clears throat> tell us a little bit about the program. Did you think it was easy, not easy? Did you find it engaging or not engaging? And this team says, I honestly went into it not really knowing what I was getting into, besides that it was supposed to help my sleep. So my expectations were really low and I guess non-existent, but definitely expectations were way over met or, or whatever. <laughs> I've noticed a huge difference. I think that the timing of the information, how easily accessible it was, everything about it was just as helpful as it could be, I think. So in response to the same question, this participant responds, I like that there is a human connection and not just saying you should do this or you should do this, but this person struggles with this and this is what she started doing. But they think that there were a couple in there that I was actually struggling with, so that was good and that it felt like, oh man, that actually really applies to me. I'd say more helpful or most helpful were the key points afterwards, because for me, in my mind, it's really easy. I like bullet points where it's just like this, 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 condensing sentences into small pieces of information that I can refresh my mind. And that was really helpful. <laughs> so in response to this question, um, one more, we say, this team says the videos were engaging. They had little images. It wasn't just audio. That was good. I think it was pretty good. And they gave you options and advice. It was, it was good because you could follow around these characters that they repeated over multiple videos. It was the thing, same thing. So you got to know some of the characters like a little series. So my amazing research coordinator, Ria, conducted a study using linear regression analyses to examine baseline predictors affecting engagement and treatment. 
And engagement here is defined by the number of video modules completed. Parent participation um, measured by parent watching the video module or not was the most significant predictor of teen engagement. This was followed by CMAT score, which is again that measure of eveningness circadian preference. So having more of an eveningness circadian preference was associated with lower engagement. High insomnia severity index, abbreviated as ISI in the table, was associated with lower treatment engagement. And interestingly, depression severity was not a significant predictor of treatment engaging. So <clears throat> in terms of acceptability of the intervention, um, we use the therapy evaluation question, questionnaire, which was given post-treatment. It's a measure which is commonly used in um, cognitive behavioral therapy of, for insomnia trials. In response to the question, how acceptable did you find this therapy user? Uh, how, sorry, how acceptable did you find this therapy? User ratings were 6.9 on average. And only one published study um, we could find reported means for the other means for this measure. Um, Dr. Colleen Carney, um, who's one of the premier cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia uh, researchers, reported in one of her in-person CBTI trials that um, she had about a 6.13 in acceptability. So ours is right um, alongside with her. <clears throat> in response to the question, how confident would you be in recommending this treatment to a friend with similar issues? Our sample reported a 6.7 on average. And again, Dr. Carney's um, study reported like 5.72 on average. So ours is um, pretty close, a little bit higher. So qualitative data on acceptability. Would you recommend this treatment program to a friend who has sleep problems? If so, or if not, why? So this team replies, it was definitely something I feel everyone can use just because of how easy it was to use and understand. Also really helpful in the videos. There wasn't anything that was too difficult to understand. And if it was something, a more academic term for stuff, it was ex explained pretty well afterwards. And a response to the same question, I definitely would because these videos are videos, uh, sorry, this team responds, I definitely would because these videos are videos I would just go and watch on YouTube. This would be something that it's very educational, doesn't take too much time. It does not, it's not like a full on course that would take up half my day or something like that. I just feel like it's on my phone. I can click on my link and that's it. I've talked to one of my friends about it and they were really into it too. In summary, we had high user engagement, especially when compared to other digital health interventions among teens. And Bright Mobile appears to be acceptable. This indicates that our low technology model is engaging and acceptable and could potentially be used to disseminate other types of interventions. We also have some thoughts about how to improve engagement moving forward. So first, we could propose a step care model targeting youth with higher evening circadian preference or insomnia severity symptoms. And second, we will promote um, more parent engagement in the intervention moving forward. So next, we'll continue to assess impact on access to care by evaluating whether we can reach those kids who needed the intervention. <clears throat> so from February 2019 to February 2020, my amazing research coordinator, who is now a doctoral candidate in clinical psychology at UCSD, worked tirelessly approaching families in our primary care site. She approached 270, uh, a little over 270 families, 39 were interested, 21 screened, and 16 screened eligible and enrolled. Then the coronavirus struck and primary care moved to telehealth. Kids stopped attending their usual primary care visits it became too burdensome for providers and patients to try to recruit in this context. So we adapted. <laughs> we switched to a community recruitment model, which was led um, by my amazing research coordinator, Raul Barrete, who's, who was able to recruit very quickly. The demand for services for sleep health among teens was very high. We mostly recruited through online parent networks. We also got referrals from our community mental health providers and UCSF providers. Thank you so much to all of you for your support. We, could not finish the study without you. So some qualitative data on reach. The interviewer asked, how likely would you have been before this study to go see a therapist, a psychologist, or a counselor to talk about your sleep problems before the study? The participant responded, not likely. 
if I was seeing a therapist for other things, then I might've mentioned it, but it just seems like a, a lot to go to them for a sleep problem like mine, which was bearable. They're not as bad as some people's. I just mean, I don't know. It's only one aspect of my life and I don't really see scheduling therapy lessons and figuring out which ones are covered by insurance. All of that hassle that goes into finding mental health care. But I would if I had a serious mental health problem and I thought I would need help. So again, in response to that same question, another participant responds, no, not really. I don't think so. I don't know. I think before it was, I didn't think of it as a big problem. I think a lot of people around me were also not getting enough sleep and it was just like, yeah, we're at school, no one gets enough sleep. Maybe it was just normalized. And then the person that I talked to about the sleep schedule was like, take this little exam. And then I was like, wow, I guess there are sleep problems. There, I guess there are problems with this. And it was maybe because I never really looked for it and no one really ever talked to me about it. So to wrap up our results in response and in, in related to REACH, we did increase access to care using Bright Mobile. There was a high demand for this intervention in the community, and we were able to reach a group that was underserved. However, there are also some important barriers to reach that we learned throughout the course of this study. So there appears to be a cultural perception that it's normal or unproblematic for teens to not sleep well or be sleepy during the day. And perhaps because it is so ubiquitous, and there are so few resources available to help alleviate this problem. Second, primary care integration really needed a primary care physician-driven assessment of sleep in order to legitimize and properly screen patients for sleep health concerns. And I think it's important to acknowledge that there's also a hierarchy of needs among patients. Our primary care clinic was right next to the WIC table and food insecurity is always gonna be more important to address than sleep health. So next, we'll continue to assess impact on access to care by briefly discussing how the intervention can be incorporated into clinic flow to support its long-term use and dissemination. And based on PCP and medical assistant exit interviews, the most important factors likely to impact the maintenance and adoption by new clinics were, as I mentioned before, sleep assessments integrated into routine care, medical staff or social worker who is able to and willing to initiate kids enrollment into the program, we lost quite a few kids to follow up from referrals, and more educational materials for families and especially in underserved communities about the importance of sleep and its ability to be modified. In the process of conducting the study, we also identified other potential avenues for delivery. A lot of kids said they wish they had this offered at school, um, hospital systems based delivery is another option. And then we learned direct to consumer based delivery might be another option as well. So in summary, our pilot trial indicates that we can increase access to effective behavioral sleep health care through by Bright Mobile. Um, the use of Bright Mobile in primary care and community settings is feasible. It's acceptable, safe, and we have signals that it's efficacious. It's ready to be used in other projects. So um, that brings me to other, what we're working on on some of our new research questions. So um, we're currently asking the question, can sleep treatment prevent the progression of internalizing disorders? And if so, what's the mechanism? So I have a, a career development award from NIMH to conduct an RCT um, with Bright Mobile against a comparator condition. And we'll be looking at kids who are at risk for internalizing disorder symptoms and looking whether sleep quality is a mechanism for improvement in, in internalizing disorder risk. I'm also fortunate enough to have received a NARSET award to try to tease apart the complex relationship between sleep, internalizing disorders, and one potential mechanism in that relationship, inflammatory markers. So in this study, we're going to examine the effects of Bright Mobile on inflammation, explore sleep health improvement as a mechanism for improvement in inflammation and explore inflammation as a mechanism of improvement in internalizing disorder risks. And next, we're also interested in whether we can make sleep treatment more accessible for other groups with a high need for effective sleep health intervention. 
So we were fortunate enough to be funded by CTSI to develop and test a digital sleep intervention for preschool aged kids with autism spectrum disorders. Sweet Dreams is currently being pilot tested. And we also have a number of potential new directions and we welcome collaborations with you all in these endeavors. We're interested in testing a step care model for Bright Mobile, developing new modules for Bright Mobile to improve nightmares among youth struggling with PTSD, testing sweet dreams among typically developing preschool age kids with sleep difficulties. So lastly, I just wanted to end with saying, I love sleep research um, because sleep is a low stigma transdiagnostic risk factor for not just mood, but cognitive, academic, social, physical health outcomes. And as we, and as we saw, it is modifiable. The implication is that perhaps in increasing access to sleep health care, we can have this domino effect, potentially improving a number of other outcomes along the way. And perhaps successful experiences with this low stigma intervention would decrease stigma about accessing other types of behavioral intervent health interventions in the future. So I'd like to thank my amazing team of research coordinators, my wonderful collaborators, my mentors who are so near and dear to my heart, and of course, my funders. Thank you so much. And um, just leave you with this slide that has my contact information and my website in case anyone has any referrals or questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Asarno. I have a quick question for you, um, and I want to take this opportunity to, to take the, to the floor. Um, so as with many of um, other health indices, we see health disparities, and we see health disparities in sleep as well. And there's, um, while there's limited data, there's some data suggesting that um, Black youth in particular um, um, uh, suffer from sleep disturbances or a different set of sleep disturbances related to um, a number of adverse um, childhood events in particular or environmental um, um, stressors, mm -hmm. um, particularly discrimination, racism. And so it's a complex picture. And so I really value how you talked about um, ASD as uh, need, that population needing a particular set of tailored sleep intervention. Um, and I wonder if you could speak to how might um, Bright Mobile be tailored, or if you thought about tailoring it to um, specific minoritized or racialized groups, considering the health disparities that we see in sleep. Yes, I think that is such an important um, question. Um, I think in thinking about sleep interventions in general. We haven't thought a lot about environmental factors that may be contributing to specific sleep health difficulties that may be different across different socioeconomic groups. And so I think one project I've really been wanting to take on is this idea of um, developing um, specific modules that relate to social determinants of health. Um, but I think it's such an important point. And <laughs> unfortunately, my answer is we don't have the research yet and we really need to do it. Dr. Stewart, but I really appreciate that point. I would welcome collaborations in doing that. I think, I think that's so, so important. Um, we can't just roll out these manualized tri treatments that aren't um, applicable to everyone. <laughs> so I really appreciate that question and comment. Please feel free to either uh, write your question in the chat or go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay, I see a question here. All right, um, lots of wonderful, 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 thank you so much um, comments. Um, and this is from Elizabeth Owens. Uh, Elis if you're still on, you're welcome to ask your question. Oh, I'm sorry. I moved on to a, a secret slide. Apologize. <laughs> I am here, but I can't see me. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you. Really, really interesting. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering in the first part of your talk, you were talking about risk factors. And I, I heard that, um, you know, shorter sleep duration, which you defined either as nine or fewer hours or seven or fewer hours was associated with the, you know, developmental outcomes you were looking at, um, depressive symptoms and poor grades. Um, and I might've missed this, but how, how late is too late when you were talking about kind of late onset of sleep as a risk factor? Are we talking about kids going to bed at midnight or, talk, or going to bed at three? Or, I mean, is, is there a cutoff that you consider kind of, you know, significant? I think that's 
That's a great question, Dr. Owens. Um, first of all, nice to eat me. <laughs> yes, okay. Um, so what my studies are sort of starting to find that it's not necessarily how late you go to bed. Um, while my research has focused on this late bedtime mm -hmm. um, uh, domain, it's really that those are the kids that are living a life that's outside of their circadian rhythm because they're okay. being forced to wake up early for school. And we find right. this again and again, when you delay school start times, kids start to do better at school. There's you know less absenteeism, mm -hmm. they get less depressed, all things get better. So I don't think that there's anything specifically wrong with just being a night owl. Okay. Um, it's that you're living a life that's not in line right. with your biology. Okay. Um, by virtue of being a night owl and the world kind of makes you. Right. So I got it. Okay. Yeah. That's helpful. There's Dr. Zeitzer, I think is on the call on the meeting as well. And he's a circadian researcher and he might chime in as well to see. Okay. You. Yes. But, um, I don't think there's any cut like time okay. per se. Okay. All right. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Jessica, Kieser, you have a question. Do you want to go ahead and ask it yourself? Uh, yeah, I just had a question about the measures you're using. Um, I feel like I'm seeing a lot of delayed sleep phase syndrome in the kids that I work with. Um, and I know when doing CBTI tra treatment, actually trained by Rachel, um, we use the ISI and morningness, eveningness scale with adults. I'm wondering if you, like what measures you tend to use with adolescents to be assessing insomnia. I know you had the ISI in one of your um, slides, but are you also using the morningness evening scale or is there a better circadian rhythm questionnaire? So there's the children's morningness and eveningness preference questionnaire, which um, is uh, a Mary Karskaden measure. And um, I'm happy to send it to you. If you send, send me an email, I can send you a link to it if you'd like. Oh, that would be great. That'd be great. Use for teenagers. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could send us um, a link for how to access info about um, some of the trials that you might have going on currently or you have upcoming? Yeah, definitely. So my website, kidsleep.ucsf.edu has links to all of our, our okay. ongoing studies that are recruiting, um, but I'm also happy to send it out to the listserv. Definitely, okay. thank you. Yeah, yeah, we appreciate all the referrals. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, of course. There, there was also an ask for, is it possible to view the program? Um, um, so the program is accessed through REDCap. If you, if anyone would like to see the video samples um, to get ideas of what I've done and whether it would be applicable to their work as well, just shoot me an email and I'm happy to send you some videos to take a look at. Um, but unfortunately, there's not like a site where they're listed. Yeah. Thanks. Tony Yang, are you still on the call? You want to ask uh, a question? Yeah. Yes, I am. I wanted to thank Lauren for a really excellent and wonderful presentation. That was really, really great, Lauren. So thank you. Um, the, the question I had was, um, there's a significant increase in suicidal ideation and suicidality among youth, especially in adolescents in recent years, um, with suicide being the number two cause of death um, going above um, accidents uh, now. And I was wondering your thoughts on applying um, sleep interventions um, in terms of like decreasing suicidality and suicidal ideation um, in youths. Um, and then the second question, and I can email you to this. I was just curious who is the uh, private um, sort of industry or private partner um, that you collaborated with and sort of like what they charged and so forth and whether the um, intervention is freely available um, for youths to use. Um, but I can email you about that. Thanks, Tony. Um, so those are great questions. Um, with regards to suicidality, I will say in our study, we had um, quite a few kids develop some suicidal, we excluded for suicidal ideation at baseline um, for safety reasons, but we had a, quite a few kids develop kind of like um, suicidal ideation throughout the trial. And one of the nice things about the study and the link to primary care is that we were able to link those kids back to primary care and they were able to really um, access uh, and address those issues immediately and directly. So I think that was an advantage of the primary care integration component. With regards to sleep and um, suicidality, yes, Tony, you are absolutely right. We've talked about this a number of times. It's an acute risk factor for um, suicidal uh, attempts, suicide attempts. I think the tricky part is I think sleep is really important 
important to address with kids that are struggling with suicidal ideation and non-suicidal um, uh, self-injury and um, all of those kind of that realm of suicidal behaviors. The tricky part is figuring out where it links up in the treatment hierarchy, right? Um, uh, because, you know, active suicidal ideation is always going to be more important than addressing sleep. But we also know that kids don't do as well in these CBT treatments or antidepressant treatment if they have sleep problems. So I think it's a really important question and there's no clear cut answer as with everything that we do, right? <laughs> these are complicated kids, complicated cases um, about where to insert these treatments. But I think this is where a precision medicine approach is gonna be really helpful and important. Um, with regards to the program, it's not freely accessible to youth right now. Um, industry experts were actually colleagues, friends that I had um, that worked at these various companies in advertising. I'm fortunate we live in the Bay Area, so we have those folks. And so they kind of helped consult with me along the way for free because this was <laughs> this program was developed entirely by me with no budget. So <laughs> um, this was a very low tech um, intervention. but. I think what's nice is that it shows that that low-tech model can really work. And so it could be used for other treatments as well. All right. Thank you very much, Lauren. I appreciate it. Um, is it okay if I just send you a follow-up email just to- Of course, kind of... it's always great to hear from you. Thanks. Okay, great. Thank you, Lauren. <laughs> uh, there's another question. Did the topic of melatonin ever come up? Not sure if we missed it. Yeah, I didn't discuss melatonin at all in this study. Um, other than to talk about dim light melatonin onset being the um, uh, one of the outcome measures for Dr. Allison Harvey's study. Um, melatonin use um, can be definitely helpful among teens. Um, we excluded for uh, melatonin use in our studies because we want to see whether our treatment has an effect or any kind of sleep medicine um, medication. Um, but melatonin has certainly has a really, really important youth in especially preschool age kids with autism and with kids with ADHD and, and so on. Thanks for that. Um, Jamie um, Zeitzer, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your last name. If you're still on the call, you could ask your question. Sure, thanks. So, so Lauren, that, that was great. Um, um, I had a quick question. I've got lots of questions, but we can chat later. But the, um, uh, my, my question is the, you presented on the, on, on the PISCI um, and not a huge fan of the PISCI for this, but um, you, know, you, you earlier identified um, sleep onset times as really the important, you know, you know, the, your beautiful studies that that was so much more important than say total sleep time. Mm -hmm. um, have you looked at uh, the sleep onset times in this group? Did you see them move earlier? Yeah, so our sleep diary data is still getting analyzed. Um, so we're still, as you know, it takes a long time to clean all that. Um, so we're still cleaning it, but it looks like we do show an effect or, um, from the brief, uh, look I had at it, um, earlier, it looks like we do see an effect for sleep onset latency. And what's interesting is we have, um, kids with late bedtime, kids with insomnia and kids with both. And so it'll be, and that's why we chose the PISCI because sleep quality runs across all of those things. But, you know, for insomnia, we would be targeting something like sleep efficiency, versus a late bedtime preference, we might be targeting um, bedtime or wake time. So um, that's the rationale for why we use the PISCI, but yes, um, right. we will definitely be looking at all those sleep diary variables. Okay. So. And, and then, then briefly, you also, um, did you ask the parents about their perspective on sleep? Since, you know, the kids, you, you, you had some, you know, the, some of the quotes from the kids, did yeah. you ask the parents and see if, if that matched up and, and if, if, their perspective actually influenced this? Yes, definitely. So we're still coding all of the qualitative data. So this, the qualitative data I presented is really from like the first maybe 10 participants that we ran because we're still coding it all. But yes, we have parents' um, perceptions and um, I don't know what the kind of net, um, I, I, I don't have a sense yet from parents what their thought was. I think parents in general, my perception from reading a couple of the interviews was that they felt like this was problematic. It was a point of real tension for them because they're trying to get their kids up in the morning and the kids irritable, cranky. Um, and they uh, were not very involved in this intervention. We kind of invited them to step out 
and really encourage or reinforce any inter, um, any kind of um, improvement in the team. Um, but I don't have the, the, the real answer is I don't really have an answer to that yet, but it's something we will be able to look at. Sure. And I think it's a really important factor as we Great. saw. So, awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself if you have a question. Um, hi, Lawrence, Tony again. Um, how young um, in children are you um, going and studying um, with your sleep? The sort of the last one you just talked to, that's the newer one. I wasn't sure how young, um, like preschool children, you yeah, were thinking sure. about studying. So Sweet Dreams is, um, we're looking at kids between um, 12 months and 60 months. So pretty young. Oh, that is very young. That yeah. is very, that is really good though. Um, yeah. You know, it's a nice intervention point because um, it looks like, you know, if we can kind of develop good sleep habits at that point, then kids are more likely to maintain good sleep habits over time. Um, so it's a nice kind of second like developmental period um, of like critical importance, I would say. So, yeah. Uh, we have a couple of our colleagues saying, man, I wish I had enrolled my child in the study. <laughs> Um, especially around COVID, right? I mean, we are, our rhythms are completely off. I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit, how to, as clinicians, intervene with sleep disturbances um, in COVID-19 times. Yeah, I have definitely clinically more seen, you know, a real uptick in um, sleep problems during COVID. Although interestingly, going back to that circadian rhythm question of living your life outside of your circadian rhythm, some kids are doing really well with COVID because they have later school start times and they can kind of live their life more in line with their biology. So it seems like there's kind of this bifurcation, which is really interesting. But certainly, as we all know, like the anxiety, the depression rates are just going up so much. And so there's that impacts sleep and, um, you know, it's bidirectional um, so, so much. But it was it's an interesting time um, for us all to be doing the work that we're doing. Um, certainly. Um, yeah. Thanks for that. Um, Narita Vlach, do you have a question? Uh, yes, uh, the, just what I wrote there. CDC has pointed out that during puberty, adolescents become sleepy later at night and tend to sleep later in the morning as a result of their biological rhythms shifting. So would this affect how you would design your intervention in any way? Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, in this, uh, in my ad health sample, I found that younger kids um, were more impacted by the later bedtime preference than older kids. That older kids seem to develop some sort of like resilience to the sleep disturbance. So I think targeting this kind of preteen group is, is important right around um, puberty. And I think it's nice too, because there's, it's kind of a new biological shift. So you can um, those, those patterns aren't so deeply ingrained. They're less likely to have insomnia on top of that, because, you know, if you have a late bedtime preference and your parents are telling you, go to sleep early, go to sleep early, then you're lying in bed, trying to sleep, then you also develop insomnia. So you're kind of less likely to have that twofer and your, your sleep is more easily more modifiable than the older kids. Okay. Um, but I think that's a, a great question. Thank you. Well, that concludes today's um, sleep uh, webinar tutorial and <laughs> um, and um, and instructions. I really appreciate your talk and um, wish everyone a good afternoon. Um, and please take note of the website kidsleep.ucsf.edu. Um, and um, everyone, take good care. And thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Stewart. Thank you, everyone, for having me.